like to contact the show, send us an email at liveonfourlegspodcast at gmail.com or get involved in the conversation on social media. Join the Pearl Jam Podcast community group on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Live on Four Legs Pod. Boston's been very, very good to us over the years and we're thrilled to be back. And... Not only can I remember uh, some of the shows that we've played in Boston because they were memorable, I, I believe we all remember every show we've ever played in Boston, whether it was the, the Axis, or the Orpheum, or the Garden, or the three nights where we tried to play every song we knew. <laughs> And since we're only playing two nights here, we're going to try to fit every song that we know into two nights. But... And away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring... Mr. Stone Gossett. Fucking camera in the truck. everybody now welcome to live on four legs a definitive live pearl jam podcast and we're back for another episode this week today we're doing another patreon episode as a matter of fact this is up from our patron joe Irichi. we'll be talking to him a little bit later in the episode but what's interesting here is that he picked the boston 2006 show and now a lot of people your mind is going to a certain show i know where you're going with this because we went there too there was a little bit of confusion at first we thought we were doing this one the night two show is the return of leash however we're not doing the night two show in this episode we're doing the night one show which in total really doesn't happen we don't do a lot of night one versus night two it's usually the night two show that we end up doing because that's always the one that kind of has the big grand finale of the two show series so we almost never get to do a night one and it'll be interesting to kind of go over it today and we'll be talking to joe about why he picked night one instead of night two hey it's his story that's what matters so let's get right into it randy sobel over here john Farrar over there hello hello yeah that could be an interesting like mini series some of the night ones that preceded some of the classic night twos that we've done sure and I kind of went around Twitter today and I asked everybody there what they thought were better night one shows than night two shows. And some of them were pretty obvious. Some of them I agreed with. I think Toronto 2011 came up. I think that's a very, very obvious one. And of course, MSG in 2003, that's the one that they shot the DVD for. Of course, that one is, is going to be more remembered. But then there are some that, you know, people... I think it's just like whatever they take to heart and whatever they find a personal connection to. I, I, I personally don't think I've been to a one or two night show. And, and there are only two shows where I've only been to the night two. everything else. I've been to both nights. I can't think of any of those shows where I liked night one a little bit better. The closest becomes Fenway in 2016. That's the closest, but I still like the second night better than the first, but it is tough, and I think the reasons for that are, are pretty plain to see. It's that, you know, you get the first night, the band can kind of put together the set list, they can try some things, 
And then they can say, all right, you know what? Well, this one we're going to leave for tomorrow night. Well, this one we're going to leave for tomorrow night. And those are the ones. They're the crowd favorites. So they're all going to be hit on night two instead of night one. I really don't have a personal history with like night one, night two shows. I think the first time I was ever kind of aware that they would do this was obviously Atlanta 94, that being the night two and that just being incredible. And then the night one kind of being overshadowed by that, even though that's a great show on its own. And then you kind of hit the classic ones as you go out through onward through the years. But by the time, you know, I really kind of started going more, especially, you know, down here in the South, they really weren't doing those two nights days anymore. The only one I've really ever done is the Wrigley 2016, which again, both nights very, very good. But yeah, we have talked about it on the show before where it's it's the night two that's always like all bets are off. Here we go. And night two is always the best one. So we're going to see if this one holds up with that or not. Yeah, and I don't know days of the week for these two shows, but a lot of the yeah. times that I've been to night one, night two, it's usually been like Thursday, Friday or Friday, Saturday. Mm. And, you know, the one that kind of rings in my mind is the Brooklyn shows that was on a Saturday night and you had the quintessential saturday night crowd in attendance that night so it's not saying that night one shows can't be as dynamic and great as night two shows i think we've seen it with a couple where worcester comes to mind the worcester night one was was pretty good and worcester night two it seemed like they were a little bit out of gas it does happen but historically it's the night two that you kind of gravitate towards because the night two they'll do I guess more big time memorable things. That's the one where the rare one comes out, as I mentioned before, Leash coming back on this little two night run here. And I'm thinking about like Amsterdam in 2012. That's the one with the fan created set list. But it's not saying that there hasn't been enough night ones that have mattered in this catalog here, but it's always an interesting conversation. Speaking of conversations, let's talk to our patron, Joe. He's the one that picked this episode, and he's going to have to explain himself as to why Night 1 was the better story than Night 2. So take a listen. 524 was my 17th Pearl Jam show, and right off the bat, the crowd, and, you know, out of those 17 to that point, more had been outside than inside. So I think the crowd really resonated with me right off the bat, you know, kind of like with that first pause where he says hello for the first time. And I feel like you can always kind of gauge what we're like based on like that first reception. And I remember on 524, there was just, there were no ebbs and flows. I felt like the energy in the crowd and even the set list, when you look at it, that's an energetic set list. There's a couple maybe of lulls, I guess you could say. You had wish list in the gone. But really, other than that, and you had the two Dylan covers at the beginning of the encore. But other than that, it's a pretty hard set list. The second encore, Spin the Black Circle, Evolution, Whipping, Rats, Comatose, Rockin' in the Free World. I would venture to say that could be their hardest second encore of all time, if you really think about it. No jams other than Rockin' and just straightforward, nasty songs. So the energy and the crowd were there the whole time on 524. I remember that distinctively. Yeah, the two encores are definitely different in style. And I think that, you know, if you go back to the Grand Rapids show, the yes. first encore is kind of a broken down version of what they did in Grand Rapids because I think they did seven songs overall. They only did five at this one. But the same kind of idea. Would you say that that would be your highlight of this? Or what would you say would be your favorite part of the show overall? Or if you yeah, want to build so to that, please do. Yeah, so keeping with just the music, and I'll get into the personal stuff after, the things that stick out to me about this show, so now we're talking 16 years later and 26 more shows for me since, and I distinctively remember, and I was just watching it, I was cheating, I was watching it on YouTube before we came on, like it's the Alive that's jam, researching, right? The Alive Jam's phenomenal, Ed stands on like one of those amps kind of in the crowd, and um the energy and the haze for that jam were phenomenal. It started right at the beginning after that second chorus. I remember that. And then the main music thing, if I had one shot to tell somebody this show, listen to this, or I would say watch it on YouTube because the video brings even more. The rocking in the free world to end the show. I love a big crowd, like a good crowd. At this point, 42 shows in, like the crowd is really important to me. And it had been a phenomenal crowd the whole way through. Ed had mentioned it. And then in the, uh, what is that? The bridge, would you call that a rocket? After the 
you know, at the end yeah. of the first jam before that final chorus. Sort of the um, pre-verse, they, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, when they break down, um, he actually gave a speech. And I mean, at this point, we've heard it from him a lot of times. But at that point, you didn't hear it too often. So you really, he gave a speech and basically said, you know, other than South America, this Boston crowd had been the best of definitely the tour. He may have even generalized a little more. I don't remember. And then the end, the final rock and jam was phenomenal. And I remember Eddie being just in the center of the stage, like doing this boxing move, like he was punching a punching bag for like the last minute of the jam. And then he just kind of like fell down and passed out laying flat on the stage. I absolutely remember. Again, it was just overwhelming energy. Just one of those Pearl Jam moments that nobody else can give you. Was there a specific moment that you remember where you looked around and you were like, this crowd is on another level. Like, this is going to be a special show. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the Alive Jam, again, when you got the lights on and everybody mm-hmm. doing the hey, you felt it there. But even sh- so, and I don't remember, I know we talked before Unemployable, but that's eight into nine. I feel like he would have one more time before that. But it I feel was, like that I first- think it was before Red Mosquito, but it wasn't a long speech at all. Yeah, I feel like the first pop. So, like, to me, the holy grail of first Pearl Jam pops is Hartford 2013. When he addresses the crowd for the first time, it was like 60 to 90 seconds. And it wasn't like this in Boston in 06. But I just feel like, to me, that's my first major measure of how good the crowd is going to be, is that first one. And the Boston one did not hit Hartford 2013 levels, although I will always be biased for that one. And I'm not usually a homer. I can do pretty good with that, but I have a hard time with that specific Hartford show. But I will say, again, that Boston, from the beginning, from that first addressing the crowd, plus when you look at the set, it's a cool set list. And I think Grand Rapids was a great comparison, because now that I get myself into the 2006 tour mode a little bit in my head, I do remember that Grand Rapids show being an underrated show, surprisingly great show, and again, set list-wise, if I remember correctly, a very high-energy show. So I do think that's a great comparison. It's kind of funny, because I think those shows were, what, five days apart? Yeah, very, very close together. The 18th, I think, was Grand Rapids. So, yeah, you're, you're right, right there. Let's get into a little bit of your personal stuff from this show. You kind of mentioned that you had some personal stories to tell from this. So what's the whole story? What makes this special for you in that aspect? Yeah, and I mean, you know, I got a group, a handful of guys who, who I go to these shows with. I mean, I've been to the most out of my buddies, and I try to get the tickets for everybody and kind of, you know, but I've gotten everybody in. So we've always had a great group of, of us that go to these shows. But on 52406, it was my, uh, my little sister's 21st birthday. I was about 25 at the time. And it was her first Pearl Jam show, which was really cool. And there was four of us, and we were all in 10 club seats. So obviously, we weren't sitting together, but we were both like, me and my buddy were lower section Mike's side, and my sister sat with my uncle, who's only a few years older than us, and they were lower section on Stone's side. We could see each other, just luck would have it. You could almost see each other, and a couple times you could, you could see a wave. So, so that was kind of cool. I went with a buddy who, um, and my sister loved it and had a blast. And, you know, that was pretty much, I think her concert previous to that was like Taylor Swift. So I think that was even her first, like, real rock and- rock and roll show yeah something like that or somebody taylor swift like it certainly wasn't a uh, seattle rock act <laughs> and then my other buddy that i sat with my buddy keith he's uh, no longer with us he was a lead singer of a local band out of western massachusetts called 30 stones who actually was a pretty popular local band in the springfield hartford area in the late 90s through like mid 2000s through 2010 2012 We've gone to a few shows together. Him and I sat together. We always had a lot of fun together. The funny thing I remember with him on this show is, um, I don't know what it was. I mean, I was in my mid-20s for these shows, so I was going to a lot of shows. I went to eight on the 2003 tour. I think I hit four on 2006, five, 2008. So I was astute in spending way too much time and money on this band at that point in my life prior to marriage and kids. So like I had gone on like a six or seven song run during the show, the end of the set main set and through the encore where for whatever reason, and it wasn't because of the guitar, I'm not technical at all, but based on the instruments that Mike and Eddie were swapping out, I called like six in a row 
and I'm not normally, again, I don't play, so I don't know. I was just kind of lucky and just knowing the set list, like the back of your hand at that point and stuff. And uh, when it got to the point of whatever it was before a live into a live and I'll, you know, I'm cheating there. It's usually at that point, pretty easy to call a live just based on the spot in the show. But, um, I said, oh, I'm feeling alive is like Mike was walking to get to the guitar and Keith was like, if you fucking call this one, I'm literally, I'm listening to this song in my boxers. <laughs> and he and you know he kind of had the lead singer ego even though it was just a local band but i think he had gotten enough attention where he felt okay with throwing the jeans down and literally listening to a live at the boston garden uh in his boxers we had befriended the people around us but he he did do it and then and as an extension of that and um <laughs> we've been we were in the same fantasy football league for quite a few years so after that happened and coming back and telling the story about keith you know uh, watching a live in his boxers in the middle of the garden. We made a fantasy football bet that next year, basically whoever's team did better in our league, their next show, they played even flow as a cover quite a bit. So the next show, if I had the better team, he had to sing even flow on stage in his boxers, just boxers and a t-shirt. And if he had the better team, I had to sing and do it in at fat cat in downtown Springfield back in the day, which isn't there anymore. I don't think so. I'm aging myself, but uh, I would have had to have gone on stage and, and do even flow in my boxers and thank God my team was better that year. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the following, whenever it was a few months later, yeah, he, uh, he performed even flow in his boxers. There's video of that somewhere lying around, <laughs> but yeah, he, uh, he unfortunately passed in 2015, but we had gone to probably five, six, seven PJ shows. I think I'd gotten them too. So that was always pretty cool and always something that sticks out in my mind. That's, that's a, that's a good little tie in right there. And of course, whenever you have a memory of somebody that is no longer with us, you try to bottle that, hold on to that for as long as you can. And I'm sure in retrospect, this one is much more important even than what it was back then. I would think, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. No, no doubt about it. And even the sister one too, you know, we both have kids and stuff now and we're pretty close, but we're not going to concerts together too often these days. So, uh, that was cool too, to get to get the little sis to a show for sure. Joe, you said you've been to a lot of Boston shows. So out of these two nights in 2006, where would you put these within the legacy of Pearl Jam playing in Boston, which is a massive, massive legacy. Where would you kind of put these? Yeah, we're so lucky. <laughs> we're just so lucky from a Pearl Jam perspective and Northeast in general. But uh, I've been to every Boston show since 2000 or Massachusetts show, I should say. And I definitely believe that these 06 shows, like, I think they're better than 08. I think they're better than 04. You can blink at that. I think they're better than 98. I think they're better than 2000, but I think that's just because the band's six years older, not because, you know, and they were just more better song. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah. those 2000 shows were great. So, you know, I think the Lee show, 525, I think you got to put up there probably in the top five or six it makes me think of fantasy football right like you want one of these top four quarterbacks or you're really dropping i feel like 525 is probably at the middle to end of that first set before you would drop off to a second level of quality um and then i think 524 would probably maybe head that second level of quality shows so 71103 orpheum 94 both Fenway twos, I guess, in my opinion. But I've been struggling with those 06 shows versus 13. I'm not, I guess I'd put Worcester one first. And no, I don't know. Like, is would you put 10, 15, 13? Would you rank that higher than 52506? No. Okay. I could go either way on that one. I guess, I guess Leash would put it over. And the Parachutes debut, I guess that's relevant. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of really awesome Boston shows in these 06 ones. I, I, you made a great point before. The 06 ones, you put those two nights together. First of all, there's very few repeats. We get, I think we get more repeats a little bit now than we did then. So there's even fewer repeats than we're used to. And I mean, you put those two nights together between Leash, Parachutes, The Crowd Night One, Rockin' in a Free World, Love Boat Captain Night One, all, all the other things, Theo Epstein Night Two, Jamming with Them and Rockin', I think the only letdown of those two nights put together is that they played rock in both nights. You didn't get a Baba, and I think that's because Theo Epstein was with them to jam on the second night. It's literally the only negative I could think of to knock on those two shows. 
Well, Joe, uh, thank you so much for pitching this episode and having us listen to it and share it with everybody. Thank you for the story that you shared today. And thank you for your patronage. Great to have you on. Great to talk to you again. Yep. Hey, man, much appreciated. I really love with you what you guys do and respect it and uh, appreciate it. And I love this band. Once again, thank you to Joe for your patronage yeah. and your story here. Very, very nice stuff. And glad we got to talk to you and glad that we got to to cover this because 2006 is a nice little era. I feel like we say we don't get to cover it enough. And then we look at the end of the year like, okay, we, we did this a couple of times. This is not the last time we're doing 2006 this year. So keeping up on that. But anything else that you feel like we need to talk about? going into this 29 song set that we're going to get to chat about. Hey, is anyone out there a fan of guitar based music in particular guitar solos? Because I I don't know anybody. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I think we might be barking up the wrong tree with this audience, but uh, just in case stick around because we're going to talk a lot about a certain Mr. Mike McCready. Let's dig right into the show. It's going to start with how a lot of the best shows always start. A lot of the memorable moments. If you were there for the first time, you would know that this would be your first song. You'd never forget it. Let's get into release. This version of release, the connection with the crowd was pretty special on it. It's just moments where Ed lets them take the first release, May, and you can just tell how locked in everybody is with it. And yeah, this is one of those versions of release that if you're in this audience, you don't forget this. This is this is one your eyes are glued to. You're just consumed by the energy, the radiation that's coming from the stage and I really love this version. I think it it just tees up what's to come in the show for sure. Yeah, there's an immediate connection with the crowd. I don't know if it's that it's release and that that immediately like gets this crowd going, but there's definitely something in the air. And Ed, he's kind of like tapping into it immediately. You can tell like we don't have the video for this. There's a video for the show, but it doesn't have release on it so you don't get the full visual of it but you can picture I've, I've seen enough videos of that during release to know when he's just kind of like letting that soak in and letting it hang and really feeling that energy from this crowd and we're going to talk about the crowd a lot tonight it's a boston crowd so you know what you're going in for and and obviously the band this is one of a few great cities that they have really really rich tradition in so they're going to understand that that chemistry is is going to happen there and they're going to bring their a game a little bit more and then the crowd is just going to fall suit on that yeah this is this is a really good and really powerful connected release so now you're going to go to four right off the bat it's severed hand worldwide suicide corduroy and animal and just kind of going down the line with a couple of these, what kind of interested me first with Severed Hand is there was a ton of loud, can you feel it energy in this. You can hear Ed in the middle of the ending solo just let out this big wow, And it just gave you a sense of how good they were feeling about this one from the early onset. Like they were in a good mood. I think this is very early in the tour still. They were obviously very excited about this record. So you get to one of what was going to be one of the fans' probably favorite live songs from this record right away. And the band is showing how into it they are. And I think that command definitely 
transfers to the crowd and when the crowd knows that the band is on with something the crowd follows suit and they're on with it too so severed hand which is in its 15th performance here people are starting to recognize like oh okay this is one i'm going to want to hear more from here on out if you're doing these avocado songs yeah i think the album had only been out for what two or three weeks at this point yeah it came out on the first or the second i think the second so about three three and a half weeks yeah yeah, Severed Hand, probably, you know, early on, one of the better translated live songs either. We're already at the point where Mike is kind of extending the solo here and going off a little bit, like we wish he would on more songs. Cough, I am mine, cough. Well, there's another one in here today that I think I'm yeah. going to yeah. get on about for sure. Yeah. You see Jeff, too, just absolutely rocking out like he's playing Porch in 1992, you know. They're really feeling the energy off of this. You can tell that there's a really good energy in the building and that they're getting a lot from this crowd. Again, Mike McCready just destroys this solo. was a really nice mic moment being energetic and getting in and out and having that energy to it i thought it was good good version of animal finish that out too mike has a really funky sounding solo in this and it feels like the band has a pretty good time with pretty much all four of these so that's a a good precedent to set as you're going on for a pretty long night here ed says good evening to boston you've done us a great honor coming out in these kind of numbers to see us tonight thank you very much We'll do our best to return the favor. And you're going to get two, what you would see now is deep cuts, but, you know, Red Mosquito probably being a deep cut for them, but Love Boat Captain's still in that, like, it was on the last album section here, and now it's it's way more of a deep cut than it was back then. But this is a really nice section for my fandom, and I think your fandom too. These are just songs that we both love. And I think that the groove on Red Mosquito was really interesting too. What do you think about that? Very, very good. And I think Red Mosquito is perfect in the spot where you come out of the quote-unquote punk rock section, the faster songs, and you need that transition song into the middle part of the set. Red Mosquito, I think, does that perfectly here. And again, this is a very, very good, almost outstanding night for Mike McCready, and this is one for him to just let loose. I think there's one point where he just throws his head back and he's just wailing two outstanding ones back to back here i thought it was excellent yeah you know like love Boat captain to me i, I really love the way that boom's tone kind of you know just seeped in there as the intro kind of went in it's one of those like hair standing on end kind of moments there and when it's not in the foreground your focus kind of gets drifted towards it you know like you hear it at first and then you hear ed kind of come in but you're like no 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 i want to listen to boom right now so you're trying to almost deflect your attention to what boom is doing and that sort of sets the tone of the song and then i thought it was a really good performance the only thing that really got me is that i am not a huge fan of when it's the seventh song in the set and ed does the let the show begin I think that should be left to an opener or a second or third song. Oh, no, the, show is any time. the show any, has any begun. The show has begun. That doesn't that doesn't bother me. Mm, I think the show has you're, begun. You're still early enough. Like if he was doing it, you know, in the encore, then we, he might have an well, issue. But I duh. think we're early enough that we can give him a pass on that. But yeah. yeah, they they sound absolutely locked in on this. Just a really really tight night for everyone in the band. They all sound good, and that lets the people who are on top of it, namely Mike go off and do their thing and he's doing the reflecting 
with the light with the mirror guitar at the end there's a little bit of the love call and response and he tells him at the end like love that's you you can tell like he's already got that connection with the crowd here and that this is going to be a good night big boom chance at the end too you thought that mike was the highlight on this i thought the boom was the highlight on this love this boom version so we're gonna also talk later about one that boom had the sole focus on that you kind of recognize him for being that song so that's like in an hour or something so if you want to scroll forward just go ahead i suppose we'll we'll have more interesting things to talk about but you know we'll be here yeah better man is the next song this was interesting to me eighth in the set feels like what they were doing with this back from like 1995 through 1998 and back then they were almost using it as kind of like a buffer transition song you'd get no tag you'd get no real jam you'd really get no crowd participation until much later that the song kind of got comfortable in the set and the placement feels a little bit odd just because it almost feels like love boat captain and better man are cut from the same cloth where both of them have similar sort of builds, both of them have similar sort of fan moments, and it felt like since you just had that with Love Boat Captain that you were able to kind of move forward and work off the momentum that Love Boat Captain gave you, and then for later in the set, there is a little bit in Encore 2, the way that they kind of closed the last couple, you lose Better Man for that moment. In, at the end and we'll talk about that a little bit later but i don't know i i thought that this was a little bit weird i, I didn't think it did the song too many favors here but it was a good performance and i guess sometimes night ones would be the ones that you'd have to like beta test something sometimes and if they were thinking you know this was very shortly after that they opened with this in cleveland i believe and sometimes it's just on their mind it's like okay well maybe for this tour an early set song so where else can we work with it and it seems after this that it would primarily be late in the set and encore on and on that it wouldn't be played in the spot but i think it could have been nicely served somewhere else I'm not saying that all. I think Better Man takes what Love Boat Captain built and expands on it and, and really like brings it home. Because Love Boat Captain is not the 90s kind of classic sing-along radio song that Better Man was and became. And for us, yes, Love Boat Captain is a song, right? That's one of my favorite ones. But for a crowd like this, you're building off of that. Like we talk about, you know, you're building that wave. You start with release and you go corduroy and you get to these big moments you're building. And Red Mosquito and Lobo Captain do a really good job of building that momentum. And then Better Man is the crest of the wave. And Better Man is kind of the height of that thing. And then we can talk about, you know, what's going to be next. And that's going to kind of kill a little bit of the momentum that you had. But I think one through eight here is very well done. And that's probably a call on Ed from getting a wild hair and being like, look, I know this crowd is going to need some moments. So let's throw in Better Man here, give the crowd a moment, see what they got. And then we'll build off that for the rest of the set. Look, they're not a perfect match, but I still think that they're in the build in the way that they kind of develop a little bit. It starts off very light. It gets to a big build. There's a rising moment. And then kind of at the end of Love Boat Captain, I guess you kind of feed off of the rest of the momentum at the end of Better Man. That's tough for me to sort of think of those two together. And I think Better Man would have worked somewhere else in the set. That's all I'm trying to say. Unemployable, though, that's going to be your one that really doesn't stick around too much after this. And it's not really, I guess, a crowd favoring moment. So we don't talk about it a whole lot. And I just really didn't have much to say about it because it just didn't have that delivery that some of the songs off this record had that became Keepers. It's a little bit of an awkward performance, too. I think there's a part in the middle where there's a little bit of a hitch in it where someone maybe missed a cue or something, and there's a little awkwardness in it which kind of throws you off. But, yeah, just a weird spot for it. And, yeah, it's on the record, and you're getting seven avocado songs here because, you know, they're fresh off the record. But this one, there's a reason they haven't played it in the last 10 years or whatever it is. We talked a little bit about how this is a Mike show, and I think we got the Mike solo song coming up next, and that's going to be Even Flow. Yeah, what what about it made this one juiced up? It was the usual tricks, but then it kind of went into a little bit something else. So what did you say? 
I always like the Red Rover, Red Rover, send McCready right over thing that Ed does. He was really like sets it up on a T form there. And yeah, like you said, doing all the tricks behind the head. But when Cameron comes in, there's a nice transition between like what Mike is doing and what Matt starts to do. And Mike is really feeling the energy off the crowd. We know like the people always go to that side. There's a lot of interaction between him and he's like pointing off to the side. And we're going to talk about at one point where Ed doesn't even know where he is. I think he's really getting a lot of good energy off of this. And I think he's really just feeling fluid and going off and just letting it go through him. I thought this was a good even flow solo. Yeah, it also kind of delved into something a little bit bluesy right before he got into the camera. And I, I wonder if that the was... Back time. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if that was due to what Stone was doing back there, because Stone was kind of doing this little, almost like a siren sound kind of effect there, and Mike was just following up on whatever Stone was doing and, and kind of listening to him, and that was a good transition to get into the Matt Drub solo. Good performance here, and Sad is going to come up and follow you up right there, and it transitions right out of even flow. What it reminded me of, and, you know, St. Louis is probably going to be covered at the end of the year. We did a poll for it, and it's in either first place or tied for first place. So if we are the tiebreakers, we're breaking that tie, and St. Louis sure. is winning. And I remember before they had the speech to Debbie, I, re- I remember hearing Matt's little hi hat hit there. And it's just kind of that ongoing ch ch ch. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh, that can only be one song. That can only be sad. And the way that even flow ended, you hear from the crowd a little bit, and then Matt goes right into that. I'm like, that right there, it kind of is a mind trigger. And some of these things that they do live just are. And almost to the point where you can hear like a count in or something like that. Or, you know, with Corduroy, sometimes he kind of does the boom, 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 like that, that little thing before he gets into it. There are certain songs that you have this little tee up that before the song happens, you know exactly what they're going into. And I thought that this version of Sad definitely had that same thing that St. Louis had, that little ongoing hi-hat hit that that Cameron did. You're saying if we're playing Name That Tune, you could name that tune Sad in in one drum hit. Not one drum hit, but like one measure. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. for sure. uh, There are definitely some I can think of like that. Everything that Unemployable doesn't do before Even Flow, I think Sad does after Even Flow. I think this is one that, again, it was a more recent, you know, again, Lost Dogs being only a few years old at that point, one that people really were attached to. This is only the 19th performance. And I thought it was really good. You could tell that, again, the band was excited to play it. There's definitely some, I'm going to go again to McCready. The video just goes to him constantly. He's over there on his side doing all kinds of crazy antics, like jumping around, doing these poses and running all over the place. And it just felt like they were just excited to play this. And that really came through on the sound of it. It sounded really good. You know, this is the song that I was thinking about that kind of got the eye and mind treatment at this show. I just wanted this to soar for another three or four minutes. Oh, yeah. I just wanted this to keep going. I think Mike had more in him. I think the band had more in him. Just keep that progression of the song continuing and then just let Mike roll with it because this solo that comes in late this solo that comes in late for the chorus where he's kind of still doing those uh, little screeching noises over when Ed's singing that can go on for another couple minutes there and that's what makes this song really kind of gives it that cathartic moment and kind of gives it that power and I thought that this was a killer performance out of Mike to do it this way it it was kind of flashy in this too so not everything can be epic. Let's just put it that way. Not everything can be the 10 minute solo. Not everything can even be a six minute solo. But sad usually averages around like three minutes or so. But, you know, it is a shame that it is a little bit abrupt. You know, when you find a momentum with something, you like to hear that it continues that momentum. And I guess if you're going to spin it positively, it just makes you want more sad. That's it. That's not a bad thing either. What a great song, so...
wish list into gone. You know, the Camaro's hood thing. He says Kenny Collins hood. Was that what I'm hearing here? Was that what you heard? Harland, I, th- I thought I heard. I don't know who that is. Yeah, but you know, last week when we were doing Milwaukee, he kind of said somebody else's hood, and I didn't even mention it, but it sounded like it might have been the same person. I got to go back to, huh. to the tape there, but I am not sure, and that's, what, seven years apart? Yeah. So I have no idea in a completely different that. part of the country, hmm. too. Hmm. So that, would be, that would be something if it was. But also, like last week's wish list this ends the same way there's no extension there's no ebo at the end there's there's nothing it it just kind of stops they had gotten off of that by 2004 2005 it was Mm -hmm. you know the the golden age of wish list was over by this point the song needs that for me to sort of have this extra survival to it like it's one of these songs that get played what do you want to say like every four shows every three shows or something And to keep it around, you want something exciting out of it. And for a lot of people, the song itself is exciting. I'm not taking that away. But I think that at the end, you give it so much more weight when you can kind of go off and create. This one and last week didn't have it. With a song that doesn't really change a lot in its intonation or anything like that, I think that you do need the back end of that to be extended and be a little bit different to sound special and unique. But Gone is following up. I I usually think of these shows and I think that Gone is going to be the big avocado moment. It felt weird. The the first verse kind of felt like they weren't doing the soaring aspect of the song. It kind of felt like they were just getting through it a little bit and not feeding into it. It kind of figures itself out while it goes along mid-song, a little bit more cathartic on the second go-around, and then at the end, you're really starting to get to something, but it didn't start off that way for me. I think it just built into all that, which is, I guess is interesting because you're only playing this for, what, the 10th time, so they're still learning what to do with it, though. Yeah, when I saw this on the list for the show, I was excited because we almost never... It's been a while, I think, since we've talked about it. And this is one of my favorites. I thought they were really kind of tight and locked in on it. I think the thing that really stuck out to me, too, you really get to hear Boom at the end and kind of in the middle, too. I thought hearing Boom kind of be prominent on it was nice and added a little bit of texture and a little bit of something extra to it. Yeah, I I really like this a lot. sounded very good. Again, just complete bullshit that the last performance of this was Moline 2014. Like, this song should come back. And that's pretty much why we don't talk about it, because if it's not 2006, then it's when. Like, when are we going to talk about it? There's no opportunity. So I guess for all of you at home that have an episode request waiting for you, if you want to hear more of this song than (laughs) 2006 shows, that's all I got. You know, we, we failed to mention something during Unemployable. Afterwards, Ed goes back and says, this is a dedication since it's a college town. We did it all for the graduates. And kind of makes a joke that even flow would be a glimpse into your future if you aren't careful. And then we kind of go back to the graduates again. I don't think that this would be the last time either. And he says, just a reminder for you guys not to turn into greedy bastards. We have plenty. We don't need any more of those. And when you think of greedy bastards, you're pretty much thinking of green disease. That's the one that pops into everybody's mind when you think of just that idea and that that sort of topic point from Pearl Jam. And I love this version of Green Disease. I thought this was bouncy right off the top, right off the jump. It's missing a couple lyrics, but nothing felt, it it all felt synced up in a way. Sometimes, especially if you're just listening to it on the boot in this point, I only watch the encores on YouTube. But at this point, like sometimes when you're just listening to that and you're like, oh, there's some kind of open space in this, you kind of get a little bit tossed up. But they were still pretty locked in. They were still pretty in sync on this. And you have to also talk about just the way that Stone and Jeff are, first of all, Stone and Jeff are basically in love at this show because their guitar and bass are magnetized during this. I don't know how they ever got away from each other at this show. But yeah, it's just like that little chugging part that kind of goes along, like sort of that going into the end of the song sounded really, really good. Just a great performance of what could be considered an underrated song.
Jeff on this, and he did not disappoint another band member that had a really good show, and we'll talk a little bit more about him later. The thing on Green Disease that stuck out was he changes a lyric to turns out I'm the one making waves. And I think that that's where he's kind of looking back. You know, we weren't out of the Bush era in 2006, but he's kind of looking back on everything that went down 2003, 2004, He's going to mention this too. There's going to be a moment in Rockin' in the Free World where he talks about, oh, you know, you can get my number from the NSA. I think they have it. He's kind of poking fun at himself for being kind of the political outlier at this point. Like, oh, it turns out I was the one who was making waves, not anyone else. So I thought that was interesting. Look, this is Boston song right here. Anytime you go to Boston, if it's one night, if it's two nights, you can pretty much guarantee that they're going to play down. And he mentions Howard Zinn. That's the connection right there. And he says that they, uh, I can't remember what year it was. It must have been 03. It must have been during the Mansfield shows. And they invited Howard Zinn on stage. And then after they did that, he would walk around town and meet some of the kindest people on the streets who said they saw him. And kind of crazy that such a intelligent human being that's been a professor and and has written some of the most well-renowned books out there at you know people are coming up to him and saying hey i recognize you from pearl jam well you know what that's why ed does this stuff because he knows that the important people that deserve recognition if he can give them a little bit of recognition then maybe people can understand the words that he's saying and that's exactly what he's trying to say with this dedication the song is written based off of some of his words and down is going to go into jeremy they're going to go back to back here and it's just a fun version you know off the heels of green disease it feels like just a good string of songs to finish on and a, and a good version of down but if you don't have much on down, I have to mention something in between songs. So either I tease this right now or we just get into it. The only thing I had on down was the lyric change where he goes into says, you know, if, if hope could grow from dirt like us, like he's reaching out to the crowd again and, and making that connection and really building that association with them that's going to pay off during Jeremy. So what happened in between down and Jeremy that is notable here? There was a little bit of a, I guess, kind of a noodling in here, and you hear it out of your right ear, so it's stone, and he noodles a little bit of Satan's bed. Just a little bit of that. I don't have the number on me. I, I know that it was played in 2006, and I guess this year would be considered more of the return of this song than 2003, where it really wasn't much of a return at all. But I wonder if that was sort of on the back end of their mind, like, oh, could they do it this show? And they never ended up doing it. But kind of in the same vein of what we were talking about with Sad before, just little, oh, that's recognizable. Then your your mind can kind of figure it out once it sort of develops. So, oh, Jeremy, it's another tee in to, I guess, kind of the college education thing. If you want to call this like the educational part of the set, then I suppose that's where we are with it. But Ed mentions it's for all the kids that didn't have good teachers, sort of in reference to Jeremy. And an interesting, interesting lyric change on this. I guess we're in a string of a couple songs here where there's lyrics change. But Ed says, kiss the recess lady's breasts. Did you catch that one? No, it went, went by fast, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I've heard that one before. I'm Unsure if that was purposeful, but definitely it was something just, uh, to getting ready for the big lucky face reveal the next night. <laughs> right. Okay. How can I change other songs to sound yeah. a little bit more tame? Yeah. For sure? yeah. Sure. Sure. But he's he's engaging with the crowd on this version a lot and just in, encouraging them to sing at certain moments. And he got to talk in 2006 about the era of Matt Cameron with the backup vocals, and this is one of the ones during the show that I thought he really stood out on. He just very, very he has. Common. Yeah. He has some on a few songs up until this point, but I think that this was the most prominent, the most apparent. Jeremy was a lot of fun this version. Yeah, he, Ed gives him the, he gives him the, oh, you take it. And yeah, very loud crowd on this night. Very, very good. If you were in this audience, well, well done. And he, Ed's going to give him some props later on. But yeah, very, very good crowd moment. And again, I, you had had a bunch of deep cuts in a row there, a couple of lost songs included. So needed a big sing along and you you're not getting a porch here you're not getting a rearview mirror so jeremy is kind of the big late set moment that's gonna 
giver if you want a chance to let loose. Yeah, and that's going to get you into, you know, life waste, and then you're going to close the set with why go. And I, I guess that, like, I feel pretty bad for life wasted because the crowd is so fired up at the end of Jeremy. And then once you hear those chords come in for life wasted, the crowd sort of dies for a second. And I guess that's the idea of when a new song comes in that they're just not familiar with yet and don't know, really know how to respond to. Like, take, for instance, a song from this year, like whoever said when it started didn't get that big kind of reaction. Like once you got later down the line on the tour, it started to, but it didn't start that way. Like, you know, uh, Dance of Clairvoyance or Super Blood Wolf Moon Quick Escape all kind of got that when people first heard them because those were sort of the spotlighted songs. But whoever said kind of had to develop into that. And it seems like life wasted at this time kind of had to too. But I think a really good decision to play this song especially in this part of the set out of all the other avocado songs, because it, it still is a big arena rock song. It still is one that once the fans kind of recognize what they're doing with it, they're like, okay, this is just flat out all go. This is flat out fun. Like this is one we can jump around to. This is one where we can kind of feel the energy of what's going on on stage and kind of get that transfer back to us. So when you do kind of hear at the end of the song, you hear a little bit of clapping and you also hear crowd cheers afterwards as well so it's kind of a tale of sort of front to back where the crowd doesn't really know how to react to it very new but still has been out for a little bit it's one of the singles on the record and then at the end totally buying in on it i thought that was very interesting for this version of life wasted yeah i think i had gone back and looked i think the life wasted video had premiered just a few days prior to the show so it was kind of in I mean, that it was shot way. in 2005 right exactly yeah it wasn't like an mtv trl hit or anything but it was out there if you knew where to find it probably this is kind of the one that they were pushing but again you know you compare it to like if you were this year and you go into like jeremy into like take the long way you can be like kind of like huh okay well that's that's a different energy life that, wasted that it's a bigger song than take the long way it is, but, you know, whoever said, like, they did it, you know, what, eight or ten shows in a row, it really got a chance to, to build, and, and some of the songs from Gigaton never did. This is only the 13th performance Life Wasted, but they would end up doing it 33 times out of the 36 shows, so it was almost every night, but it hadn't really gotten a chance, I think, and I think I, I like it more at this point, you know, give me a Wasted Reprise, tie it in, and give them something to transition after Jeremy, but... Jeremy into Life Wasted into White Go is a little, little weird on paper, but by the end of it, they've, they've kind of turned the crowd around on it, and it's going to build to the end of the set. Yeah, and look, once again, Matt on the backups, this is another one from Avocado where you just hear him oh, on yeah. the backups right away, and you're like, okay, that's what this record is going to be about. We're going to get some new things that we're not expecting here. So yeah, just really good stuff, and, and Mike and Ed on the back end just sounded really good in, in tandem here too. Just very, very good. And then Wygo is going to close it out, and the crowd is just fully engaged and about to explode with this because obviously it's a 10 song. Obviously, it's, it's something pretty big. And, and you know, for a lot of people there that were at the Mansfield shows, they remember when they brought it back. And this might be the first opportunity that they're getting a legit version of this that sounds nostalgic, that sounds classic, the, the, Wygo, the classic yeah. right, the version that you remember from the record. Sure. Yeah, I can, I can go with that. And like giving it a chance to have the spotlight here. And you know, why goes one of those songs? It's a chameleon. It can fit wherever in the set. And sometimes like when, when they do kind of a song that they don't normally end a set with, like a go or like a corduroy or something that you don't normally get, they'll play it up a little bit and like make it a little bigger than it normally is. And I think the crowd does that. I think, again, another very good Mike McCready moment here. Just a fantastic main set for him. Just up, all up and down. Very, very good. But it didn't really, I felt like they could have even gone more. Like they could have let this be like one of the most epic why goes of all time. Like really let loose on it. And I felt like, oh, when I saw this again, when I saw this on paper, like, oh, why goes ending the main set? That's going to be crazy. And it was just good. It, it didn't, like a lot of times, like we say, go is the best example I can think of where it's very, very good, but when it ends the set, it has that extra juice to it. 
right? The one that makes you wanting more for the next encore and everything like that. I got the same thing, and I think I know what it was. I think that Ed's vocals were a little bit more passive aggressive than straight up aggressive. This is a song where you want Ed to be a little bit aggressive, have a little bit more of the bite. And it just seemed like it was a little bit passive by him. I don't know if that fits into what you were saying. Uh, Could be. Yeah, maybe, maybe that could have been part of it. Sure. All right, we're at the first encore here, so let's pause for station identification and talk a little bit about Patreon and everything else that's happening. We have recorded an episode for Patreon for the exclusive platform that will be coming out later this week, and it is the next rendition of the Late Night series where we'll be talking about Save You and I Am Mine from Letterman in 2002. And a lot of things to talk about there. Any tea up for that, that, that you want to share to the people, what they could be expecting in, in this episode. Ooh, uh, how about, how about cuff you? Cuff me. Cuff me. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We got a little bit of that, a little bit of flavor from stone Gossard on that version of Savior sure. too. Sure. So also a little bit more about boom and, you know, this being the first public appearance from boom Gaspar and the Letterman shows, tell a story of what's going on with the band at the time. And some of them are absolute legendary performances. Some of them you might not remember more than the rest, but they all kind of tell a story of where the band was at the time. And I think that this one will do the same sort of thing. So hopefully you guys that are on Patreon will be able to listen to this one. And hopefully for you guys that have been thinking about Patreon or would like to know more about Patreon, what you're getting out of, the platform is you're getting all of our exclusive episodes that we've done in the past that we'll do in the future that we'll be doing in the present. And a lot of the stuff like the evolution episodes, how many countless times can we say it, that those are our favorite things to do and stuff that we're really proud of. We've kind of likened it to doing sort of thesis papers in a way of songs and, and breaking down every single part of what goes into the history of a song live. I haven't really seen any other outlet really do it like that. So I guess I don't want to say it's educational because that would kind of be a turnoff, but edutainment. It is edutainment, sure. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you like these songs and you always wanted to know more about them, and I can run down the line, I mean, it's all the fan favorite stuff. It's like hard to imagine present tense release, footsteps, nothing man, mortality in my tree, yeah, like go yeah. on and on and on. Very, very good songs. Present tense. Yeah, yeah, they're all there. So if you like any of those songs and you wanted to kind of know more about where they came from and what happened to them and where they are right now, then that is a good outlet to check all those out. They're all on our Patreon platform. The next one that we're going to be doing that is going to be out and hopefully done pretty soon is going to be WMA. So we'll work on all of the versions that happen just as WMA without the tag just on itself. And then we'll talk about the history of the tag a little bit as well. So Patreon, if you're interested, all you got to do is donate a dollar a month and you'll get all those exclusive episodes. But if you want more stuff for you, as in a little bit more perks, then you can join up on the gig leg tier. And for the gig leg tier, like Joe does, Joe signs up to gig leg tier and he got this episode request today. So you can have an episode for yourself for the future and tell your story on our podcast and people love to do that. And we've been telling a lot of great stories lately. So hopefully you guys will be able to buy into that. And if you want to go a little bit further, help our website project and also get a fan profile for yourself on our Patreon exclusive platform. Basically, the profile is just talk about your history and your show stories and stuff like that with the band. It's a lot of fun stuff. So we've had a countless amounts of fan profiles in the past, and we're looking forward to doing some more in the future, too. That's the Horizon Leg tier that you can jump in on. That's $10 a month. The Gig Leg is 5 and the Bonus Leg tier is $1 a month. It will help out the podcast. It will help out everything we're doing, and we can do more. And then, look... You know, you guys all joined up on the tour, most of you, some of you at least, and you all got the tour reaction stuff. And a lot of that helped us be able to go out and do more things on tour while we were there. So hopefully we'll get the opportunity to do that if they announce something for 2023. And we will hope to be there as much as we can be. And same thing. 
if we keep getting the donations and you guys keep contributing, then we'll be able to do stuff on scene, on site to get you guys the instant analysis, instant reaction. So if that stuff all appeals to you, patreon.com slash live on four legs or download the Patreon app and search for live on four legs, or you can just go to live on four legs.com. There's a button on the main page, the non made page, one of the concertpedia pages, one of the blog pages. They all say, Become a patron. It's a big orange button. All you got to do is tap it. And there you go. Just sign up right on our website. So you can do that there. On top of that, what I want to mention right here is also that we have had a couple of blogs come in for fan reports from some of the September shows. And shout out to Danny. Shout out to Dakota that have really helped us and, and wrote some really fantastic stories for those and just kind of, you know, being vulnerable and being open to, to sharing. And I, I just love when people are able to kind of share their stories like that. And if that's something that you guys are interested in, just writing up and telling us some of your stories from the road, then yeah, please do. Please, you know, send us an email. Let us know that you're interested live on four legs podcast at gmail.com. I just put one out this week for the Toronto show and I'm working. That's one one out of seven right there on a seven part series. So I'll be working on the Apollo one for a little bit, and then just kind of keep going as I find the time and and work on it. But yeah, there'll there'll be a lot of those coming up in the future too. But hey, if I'm running a long time not getting the fifth version out of these, then hopefully we can get some good stories from you guys that we'd be able to post and share with everybody. So if that's something you're interested again. Live on four lights podcast and gmail.com. Just shoot us an email and we'll get you right to it. So, all right, back to the rock. Ed says it's a special occasion for multiple reasons. The top one being that Boston has been good to us on a number of occasions and it's been a thrill to be back. I believe we've remembered every show that we've played here from the Axis to the Orpheum to the Garden. And if you hear the word access, then maybe you want to join Patreon in the next week or so and get something that's kind of connected to that wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the three night stay that we tried to play every song. And since we're playing two nights here, we'll try and play every song we know in two nights as well. There's another special occasion tonight. We'd love to raise a toast to Bob Dylan, who turned 65 years old this evening. And here's something that's aged pretty well. He's old enough to retire, but good news is, I don't think he will anytime soon. <laughs> what what are we? Uh, Sixteen years yeah, later, and on on tour. Yeah, last nothing, year. nothing yeah. changed, right? He's mm-hmm. eighty one. So he's eighty one. Good for him. Good for him. Yeah. And granted, I, I did get to see him in the year two thousand and six, <laughs> and it was not pretty. And I think most people that go and see Bob Dylan know that it's still special to go and see him because you still have an understanding for for how important and valuable he is to to the history of music. So, yeah, for anybody that is graduating, we're going to play the song for you as well. And this is the OTOTO, the debut, the last time, the first time of Forever Young. May God bless and keep you always. May wishes all come true. May always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every road and may you stay. This one gets completely lost within the pantheon of not even Pearl Jam covers, but OTOTOs and yeah. everything. Like, how often does somebody go back 
to this version of Forever Young and say, oh yeah, like let's go back to and listen to that. Let's play that on Pearl Jam Radio on and on. Like we just don't get it, right? Yeah, I, I agree. It's just one of those ones that's kind of been semi forgotten about, and I think it's overshadowed by the one that follows it here, which has sure. kind of taken on a new life, and especially around this point, kind of became more prevalent and more timely. But I mean, Forever Young is nice. Like, it doesn't have a bite to it. It's just kind of a nice, kind of sweet song. It's just Ed and Jeff alone on stage doing their thing, and it's short and sweet, and then it sets up the heaviness that's going to come after. But I think it was just a nice thing to do for the birthday. They probably forgot to play it the next day. If you had asked them to play it on night two, they probably would have forgotten. Yeah, just a really nice version. I think you can kind of depict it as one part sort of passion, and even going into Masters of War, one part kind of dark too. And I think that kind of comes from just a little bit of the bass in the background. It's the upright bass, so right. it's not normal kind of juicy bass flow. And also it's just Ed on acoustic guitar, so you're not getting a full rendition of something here. But it, it does work in two different ways. And I guess the little bit of darkness that it does have into it really does transition nicely into Masters of War that once the crowd gets it and knows right away, which they pretty much do, this is a great reaction right at the beginning. You you do see a stagehand run in and give him a lyric sheet, though. Did you notice that? No, it's funny. Yeah, yeah, like right before he starts singing, somebody runs in, switches out a paper, and runs right out. And, I mean, this song has about a thousand lyrics, so I'm not going to blame him for that. Not one that they play a whole heck of a lot, but the scene and just watching this on stage and most of the video is you know focal point on ed and it's really not until the end that you get to see mike which which kind of stunned me but yeah you're getting these dim lit lights going on and ed progresses as the song goes forward and gets angrier and angrier as the song goes on you can kind of see his his body gyrating all around when he you can tell when he's doing that he's sitting down he's kind of itching to let something out but the way that this song just kind of goes nothing will ever ever be the 92 tribute show it's just not but you can hear those little pieces of his voice soar in this and it brings you back to that moment i like these versions where each time through a new part will come in it first off you look and it's just ed and you think like oh is this going to be like an ed solo performance and then you hear bass comes in then you hear cameron come in like that drum kind of thunders in and it like elevates everything like it felt like every verse just felt elevated and like the tension was ramping up then like i said you see mike come in and he's playing like slide style just sitting down with the guitar in his lap just like going off on that thing and i really really love these performances in masters of war from kind of the mid aughts it really gets to something cool and like you can tell ed's definitely feeling it like i said still in the bush era still very relevant so he was definitely putting a little bit of extra juice behind this one but i see through your eyes and i see through your breath. Like I see through the water that runs down my drain You fastened all the triggers For the others to find And then you sit back and watch As a That, that feels like it's building into it, just that ball of anger and vigor that's coming out of Ed where he kind of goes into some of those lyrics to, you know, is your money that good? And he's able to embellish some of those lines and really tell the story. It's a big moment that comes out of this song. It's, it's a big moment from the show so far. Absolutely. Crowd erupting at the end makes it feel like it's even bigger than, than what it is. And that's that's a really, really good sign. 
awesome crowd moment in Crazy Mary as we go Crazy Mary inside job back to back. I don't remember the last time that Ed really gave them all that room to sing the entire line from Look Down into the House of Mary until the Mary Rise Up above it all. And the whole crowd does it at that point. And I thought that that sounded pretty cool. Ed just kind of letting them go. And I think that takes a lot of trust to have Ed just let it go like that. Like he knows that this crowd knows these songs he knows that they've been on top of them all night so i think that at this point in this kind of song i think he's able to just say all right let's hear it from you and the crowd gives it right back to him that respect from ed has got to be earned on this and you know we're only a few years removed from the mansfield shows like you mentioned to start off the encore so they remember that stuff he knows that he can give it to them and they're going to do the job and take it and not let him down but this crowd's earned it. They do a fantastic job. Yeah, this is one of the best crowds I've heard in a long time. Look, you mentioned that this was a Mike show, but Mike is definitely on the back seat during this. Usually we get the duel, but this is all boom. Legitimately getting a big moment on this. Yeah, we're not too far removed from Grand Rapids, which is one of the greatest Crazy Marys of all time. Sure. So yeah, Boom is definitely taking the focus here, and I think Mike's had enough moments here. He can let Boom have one here to give him a moment for the crowd. Great visual moment here too while boom is soloing and and just playing his heart out ed comes over he goes right behind the the b3 and <laughs> boom takes a moment ed pours a swig of beer or wine whatever it was down his throat and just kind of like there you go man you've earned this very very <laughs> cool moment inside job though oh boy inside job was something special from this show and out of all our versions that we've heard in the last year or so, this one feels like it should be the one that you go back to where you're just like, this is exactly what this song needs to connect with the crowd. It's what it needs to connect with the band. It felt like it had just that kind of heart to it. When you kind of feel the song sort of elevate and it comes in all different spots. It comes in when they really get into the full part of the chorus and everybody starts to build that tension up and build into that powerful moment and kind of feel it together. You, you sort of see the band all looking at each other and you're finding this wave of exhilaration. You know, this song, I guess, is developed off of, you know, a dark subject matter and the idea is that you're able to kind of find that light as they would say in the song and that's when it becomes big that's when it becomes a really emotional moment and i think that this song had all of it and not only that but it had a double neck guitar on it too so yeah. you can't really go wrong I they played it i think it was getting there 
I remember even thinking when the when Avocado came out that they might not even play this because it's just really? it has that really long instrumental intro part and thinking like that really kind of wasn't where they were at the time. Just remember thinking like I don't know if this is going to be able to translate, but. Yeah, obviously it ended up being something really cool, and you know, every time they break it out now, it feels like a big moment. But again, this is obviously Mike's song, and this is a great time of Creedy Night, so it fits in perfectly. The whole time, you can just feel all six members of the band just living through this moment and just experience it as they go. I can see them going backstage, taking a second to be like, hey, what worked tonight? And seven times inside job, <laughs> they could have been saying like, hey, inside job needs to be on the next set list let's do that let's get that back again you're right they didn't play it that much up until this point but i think that they were starting to figure out what they had with it on this version alive is going to close out your first encore there's it feels like a big time celebration out of a lot of emotionally told songs that just came before that you sort of needed to let out that big sigh of relief and be able to kind of let yourself go again and be able to celebrate get emotionally positive power that kind of radiated through it and yeah the whole band is just jamming together mike gets on top of this big massive platform it looks like he's 20 feet tall and it's a great moment for the crowd to witness there and a great end capper to an encore that i thought was top to bottom excellent i absolutely love this version of live and most of 2006 alive i think probably the best year for the song since 1992 and you know i can't think of another time where i've seen ed with a wireless microphone where he's yeah able that was to weird. kind of just walk around axel rose style and just kind of command the stage a little bit like obviously they can do that whenever they want to it's kind of surprising that you never ever see him do that other than that i thought this absolutely just kicked ass matt cameron hitting all those accents and hitting every single moment to let that crowd take it and the crowd taking it over and doing the big like hey 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 yeah you're watching mike and jeff side a lot on this video jeff again absolutely looks like he's having the time of his life just bouncing around it really felt like this had a lot of power behind it up there when we get to top three and normally alive has to be something really special to differentiate from the versions we hear week in and week out but this one i thought really stuck out it felt like building off of everything on this encore a big cathartic moment and for the crowd to just kind of take over and kind of make the song become what it would and they know obviously the storytellers is going to be shortly after this we'll get building up to that moment a little bit after the show in the next little while so kind of felt like a rebirth for the song and this version i think is is up there with some of the best encore two ed shouts out a lot of people in the back and the other people in the other back you've all made yourself incredibly known tonight and hey another shout out to grand rapids believe it or not grand rapids was okay but as far as singing voices go you got everybody beat and that's the honest truth so we're going to hit you real hard. I think that was more of a, an emotionally charged encore one. And now you're going to hit hard with punk rock songs and big, fast, energetic stuff. Spin a black circle into evolution, into whipping. And yet you're firing right out of the gate. It starts off nicely. And I think this is exactly what the crowd needed. And it's kind of the counterbalance between the three sets for sure. But what a strange finish the next two songs would be before getting into rocking in the free world that don't 
ever happen where they're happening here. And I think that's going to go back to my point about better man. It can go back into a point about porch. It can go back into a point about giving a fly and black, not being in this set, but yeah, yeah, no Before black. getting into that, let's talk a little bit about this because there is a moment in Spin the Black Circle where you get to see Jeff is wearing an orange shirt that says Stone on it. And right. yeah, so Stone is about to become, you know, while you keep saying Mike, 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 Stone is about to become the guy here. So this is going to be a Stone show for the rest of the time. All right. That's right. And not just that, but like Jeff is in such a good mood at the show. Everything from, you know, all of his moments next to Stone and, and rocking out together with Stone to, to even this, he's getting to dance a little bit. And that's never the case. You know what I mean? Like this is usually at a time where Jeff is like, okay, I'm just going to hang out in the background. This is going to be cool. I'm going to rock out a little bit. But Jeff is getting a little like kind of corny here in a way. And, and it's interesting to watch. Yeah, I, I did notice that. And I usually don't like to talk about what the band members are wearing because I think that can get kind of dumb. It's a and, stone shirt. And gossipy. But no, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about even before that. Jeff is wearing like three quarter length pants with, with some kind of shiny shoes, like looks like very expensive, fancy dress shoes with like this punk rock three quarter homeless person pants and then a T-shirt. Very, very strange. Someone in the crowd has made orange shirts with just lowercase stone on the front. I got to think that during the break, they were like, Stone, you got to wear the shirt, man. It's your name. And he goes, I'm not doing that. Jeff goes, I'll do it. I'll, I'll put on the stone shirt. So he comes out paying homage to the man on the other side there. Jeff is just having the time of his life. I love this version of Spin the Black Circle. I love when they come out and do kind of a punk rock encore, too. It made me just wonder like have they ever just come out and gone straight through like what if they ended with sonic producer here instead of rocking the free world just go for it completely just all two two and a half minute blasts i think this version of spin the black circle is fantastic really really good energy on stage all four of them on the front there just on fire i felt like that's going to build into the rest of it as well it gets crazier when you get into evolution too because ed that's when he puts it on himself and then it's all because of all the stone solos, it becomes admire me, admire my son, admire my stone. And then lifts his shirt up as he was flashing the crowd and everything like that. Gets down to his knees, bowing to the master as he solos. Yep. You know, just a straight up fun time in the encore. How about that solo too? Like Stone's evolution solo extends into the chorus. Like how often do you see him keep it going? Normally Stone is like, hey, I'm going to get in, I'm going to get out, I'm going to do my thing. He lets that go when Evolution comes back and kicks back in. He's still soloing for another few seconds. That's like Stone letting his hair down times 10. You never hear that. continues the big train of momentum another ripper version of this that proves to what they set out to do early in this encore worked really well now ed kind of addresses this we don't normally play it but we will dedicate it to the rascular we never played it but matt played there with soundgarden so he turns to the back and say let's play it like this is the room but it's really smaller than that look rats is being played for the second time since the albany show where it came back 12 days prior to this one yeah yeah i think that at the time this was seen as being the big song that had the big return until the next night and then i think everybody would probably have forgotten about rats but on paper it does feel a little weird to see that rats and comatose 
are your last two songs to happen before Rockin' in the Free World. Comatose is usually used in Encore 2, more often than not. It's weird to think of, but going back to shows that we've done, going back to the history of it, it's played in the Encore a lot. But you want more familiarity before you go into Rockin' in the Free World, don't you? Don't you want... Nah. Get don't you want porch? I don't know. No. Like, no. I... Mix it up. But again, that's like you're considering the history of what the song had at the time, and you want the crowd to get a couple of big crowd moments in before the end, and Comatose is just one that I'm sure they haven't really acquainted themselves with yet. I don't think it matters here. I think the crowd has been so good on this night that he trusts them to kind of go along for the ride. We're going to go, and we're going to see if you can follow us. I thought Rats was a nice surprise. Felt like they were having fun and a really good version. I, I can feel what you're saying on paper. I thought, you know, you look at this and you expect your bread and butter there. And Comatose is definitely not bread and butter. If it shows up in Encore 2, it's usually starting Encore 2, like in the Spin the Black Circle part, and then you're going to get into other things. But actually, you know, Comatose is one that I don't love as much as I probably should on the record. But you listen to this, and when it gets to that chorus, it just explodes. You know, I know I sound like a broken record, but it really felt like they were pushing it and really putting a lot of energy behind it that they were getting back from this crowd. I think they wanted to come out and just have this encore too, just blast through it. And then there is enough, I think, of a moment after Comatose where he just kind of stands and like lets that appreciation soak in from the crowd, feels it and has a moment to just appreciate that before he kind of does the speech about like hey you know here we go we're gonna finish off here they've done that so many times i think he had mixed mixed up sometimes you know finish off with with the rats comatose and rock in the free world again it kind of reminded me of one of our setless traps yeah and sometimes they don't go exactly as planned but yeah. i think when you see this this is a night one set they know they have more to play with at night two and that's why maybe they can kind of take a little bit of leeway with it. So I can kind of see that. But again, like, you want to have the strong finish. And I buy it from what you were saying about Comatose, that this is a version that actually does work. This song doesn't have a great history. The way that this song would evolve would not really work out in the band's favor. But then I think that they still felt something with this song that gave it the energy that it presented. Overall, there's so many other songs that you're missing on that I just thought it was just a little bit of a missed opportunity. All right, rocking in the front world right now. Ed soaks in the crowd and says, God damn, you make us feel like Larry Bird or something. Enjoy your evening, include us in your toast, and we'll do the same. And now let's dive into this where Ed goes through all the intros and everything. I think that we sort of mentioned it a little bit earlier this is where ed has no idea where mike is yep. and it seems like what he's doing is playing patty cake with jeff all the way on stone side okay that's what it seems and jeff is introduced as wearing the orange stone shirt and you can sort of see he's doing this kind of like leg kick dance oh yeah and it reminds me a little bit of like shit that les claypool does He's got the smile on, like, you know, as, as he's, like, faking doing, like, a musical production or something like that. It, it's really funny, but you're like, wow, you don't see anything like that out of Jeff, ever. And then you get and just letting it go. Stone Gossard! And Stone kind of smirks and does the whole, you can call me, you can probably get my number from the NSA. And it says, check the tapes. South American crowds are great, but I don't think anybody was better than Boston. And then Stone goes off at the end of the song and just rips the solo. Oh. So much love for him in the encore and a big party energy to finish Rockin' in the Free World to finish this night. So that's the energy. That's the energy party song. What'd you think of that? Yeah, they absolutely just rock it out at the end. You know, Cameron amps, amps up at the end and, and kicks into high gear and it, it's on from there. I think this is like a nine minute version of Rockin' in the Free World. So Yeah, it's ten on paper. So. Yeah, absolutely great. Great way to end the night, giving the crowd the appreciation for what they did. Yeah, I thought it was cool. All right, let's get into our top three. I'm going first on this one. I think I'm going to go number three being release. I just thought it kind of set the tone really nicely. And I thought you just feel the connection 
that they're creating with the crowd. And like I said, this is a really good one where if anybody's going to their first show, this is a moment that they're never going to forget. I'm going to go probably with Masters of War at number two. This is always one whenever it does come in to shows that we're covering, which is not very often. That is just so much fun to to listen to and go over because it just it's one of those covers that they do that isn't like Forever Young. I wouldn't consider it more of a deep cut in the Bob Dylan category, but I guess you would kind of think like, okay, maybe a, more of a typical band would usually pick one of the top, like obviously all, all along the Watchtower and, and other songs like that, but they kind of find one that's a little bit more deeper into the hole to, to go through and, and they make it theirs and they get really, really good with it. They find a good place. So then I think number one, I think it's inside job. I yeah. loved it. I love this version of inside job. And I think that even in the seventh version, they were able to find what made the song special really early on. My number three is going to be Masters of War. I agree. Very, very good performance. These performances, like I said, in the mid-aughts kind of took them on a new level with the song and very, very good the way the song kept building on itself and it turned into something really special. My number two, I think we're on record that you hated this. Love Boat Captain. thought it was what very, did I say? good. Did I say Love Boat? You are, <laughs> you are gaslighting me, my friend. You, I you never didn't like s- to let the show begin. You didn't like. Oh. I didn't like how Better Man followed it up. I love the version. <laughs> well, I don't, you're gaslighting me, man. You're making me look bad. <laughs> Come on. Check the tapes. It's my number two, Love Boat Captain. Really, really good version here. And my number one is actually Alive. Really, really stuck out as a powerful version. Love 2006 Alive. Hit all of the great moments and reminded me of everything about it, why I loved it as a kid. Now it's time for the fateful rating of the show. What I'm going to take out of this is that, you know, when you think of Night One shows, as we kind of talked about in the beginning, you think of that it's sort of the primer for your night two you know the night one is be like oh we got something really good but night two just you wait the night two show is going to be the one to watch out for and i think more often than not it does happen that way but i think this was a pretty good setup for what was to come in the second night i think you do get a lot of surprises there i think you do get a lot of songs that might have fit more of the bill in the rarities category there and you, you do get some rare ones here too, like not putting that past this one. But I think that I had a little bit of issue with some song placement and things like that. I thought that a couple songs that it was just a little bit kind of passed by, but really not a bad show at all. I'm going to give this an eight. Okay. Interesting. I think I, you know, going back to the night one, night two thing, I think I was probably a little maybe underestimating the show or, um, Your preconceived notions of night one bit. shows are usually yeah. that they're the weaker ones, right? Yeah, I think I probably came into the into the show with a little bit of that, like thinking like, okay, this is going to be a pretty standard, you know, night one night. They're going to be, you know, kind of getting warmed up for the next one. But the show really impressed me. And, you know, uh, I ended up liking it a lot more than I thought it would. A lot of really, really good crowd moments. Some great McCready stuff. The stuff with Jeff and Stone at the end is fantastic. It also has a really good night. I thought the band was really, really tight. Had a lot of good energy on stage. I'm actually going to give this a nine and a half. And Jesus, whoa. I think that surprised me. But I think looking back, like, I didn't really have a bad thing to say about it. And, yeah, I mean... For me to give a show with worldwide suicide a nine and a half is believe me that that surprises even me. But well, you have to give something from two thousand six a nine and a half at some yeah, point, right? Yeah, yeah. This was great, and I'd I'd recommend going and checking it out. And you know, thanks to Joe for telling the story and bringing it up because this is one that I don't know that I'd ever you know ever even listened to, maybe more than a song here or there. But I, th- I thought it was a really standout show, and if if you know if night two is better, then it's going to have a lot to live up to. Yeah, you know, what's interesting about Night 2 is that everybody remembers the one thing, but you got to kind of now, because they sort of, you know, threw out the first punch here, you kind of have to see how they followed up with that and, you know, how many rounds they were able to go. So it's been a while since I've listened to that full show. I believe I have before, but at some point, look, we're going to cover everything. I'm sure that's going to be something. We have a lot of 
patrons and people that you know are from boston that are going to want and request something and i'm sure that this is going to be another one that's going to get on our list at some point in the future so when we get to it we'll be able to talk about that and maybe we can call back some of these moments that we talked about today so i think i think we still have 66 more 2006 shows to cover that's not terrible if my, uh, if my notes are correct I think that's, it's the, that's, that's the not most, too bad. The most from any year that we have yet to do. Oh, not that's not true. 1992. 1992. More, but yeah, uh, after that, 2006 is the most we we've yet to do. That's not too bad. We'll get to that in like 2038 or something. Sure. Next week, we got to just start one week at a time, and I think that by doing the show that we're going to do next week means we're going to go back to an era that we haven't talked about in a really long time. And that is the no code era. We're going back to 1996. What was the last time we did a 1996 show? If you have to ask that question, that means you have no idea, right? Augusta back in June. I guess it was Augusta back in June. You're right. Yeah. Because I remember when we did the Berlin show, very famous Berlin show that happened in 96. The night after is in Hamburg. And there's a moment in the show where Ed says, wow, this is pretty good. You guys are better than the night before. And I think that has always been kind of something that we put on the back burner a little bit. And because we had the time and because I believe it's an anniversary of sorts that we decided that this week coming up would be a great time to do it. So Hamburg or Hamburg, whatever you want to say, from 1996 will be what we aim for next week. Once again, a big thank you to Joe for coming on and telling his story and just setting the tone for the whole show. Very, very good stuff. And also for his patronage. And hopefully everybody that's listening out there that hasn't gotten us their episode choice yet, please get in touch. It's time. We've got to put you on the list because 2023 schedule fills up, guys. It does. We like to get things done ahead of time. We like to plan it out accordingly. So if you got something that you want to get done, we want to get it done as soon as humanly possible. Most of the people that have requested something that didn't get it this year are getting it in 2023. So maybe if you pitch it now, then you'll have the opportunity to do that too. All I'm saying. So Excited to hear from you guys that haven't heard from yet. And if I don't hear from you guys, I'll make sure that we reach out because that's you guys deserve it. So anyway, thanks for tuning in. If you like the pod and you subscribe to Apple or Spotify, then please feel free to give us a rating on either platform. Five stars would be preferable, but hey, you guys have opinions. If you really didn't like something, then maybe it could be two or one. But we're not going to, you know, or, or we're not going to suggest you do that because we want the help. Really, it all comes down to word of mouth. And anybody that can tell somebody else that they like the show, then somebody else is going to be like, okay, if that guy likes it, then I'm in. Let's see what you got. So if you're on Apple, if you subscribe on Apple and listen to it on Apple, then you can leave us a comment there and just let the crowd know, hey, like, this is what these guys do. This is what I like out of these guys. And this is why you should listen to them. So that's all it is. It's just an easy little thing. I think we promised from people that if you did that, that we would send you a nice little gift as a thank you. And that thank you would be a bootleg in return. And, uh, you know, if you guys are nice enough, you say nice enough things. It could be a bootleg from 2022. So just, just be nice. Just be nice. That's all you got to do. And we'll hook you up. All right. Until next week, this may be the end. We're here, but not for much longer. And although we may be parting ways, miss you already, miss you always. From Boston to Hamburg and everywhere else that we're going to end up going this year, not much time left in 2022 to do stuff. So I guess we got to get it all in before it goes. Until we do, we'll see you then. Red Rover, Red Rover, send McCready right over. Yeah.